Hey guys, this is Ian from Tech Tech Potato, and this week, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger announced during their Intel Unleashed event five new ways in which Intel will reform its future. What's your minimum specification? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. So over the course of an hour, while at the same time Intel also updating its full year prediction results for its financials, CEO Pat Gelsinger outlined several ways in which Intel will ref reform its future under the title IDM 2.0. IDM in this context meaning integrated device manufacturer. And Intel wants to highlight this as one of the advantages it has by having its own fabs and producing its own chips. Now, Intel highlighted five different key areas for this presentation, which three fall under this whole IDM 2.0 barrier. And it's all about building, expanding, and productization. So first up, building. One of the key highlights of this announcement was $20 billion now going into two new fabs at their Ocotillo campus in Chandler, Arizona. Now that campus already has four fabs, so they're increasing their fabs there by 50% with a $20 billion injection. Uh, no context of to what process nodes these fabs will be in, except that all we know is that they will be leading edge based on UEV or better. Um, at the same time, Arizona is also getting interest uh, from TSMC and Samsung for their fabs. Uh, so there is a little bit of in, uh, concern there as to water supply and uh, supply chain issues. Though no doubt more fabs will create more jobs in the area. Intel says they'll create 3,000 jobs, 3,000 high paying jobs, 3,000 construction jobs, and 15,000 more jobs in the area just due to the ecosystem around what's needed. These two fabs will be the initial part of that project. Uh, Intel is also looking to expand fabs in Europe. And the whole thing behind this is bringing more of, in, more of the supply chain for semiconductors inside the US and inside localized areas, uh, which is a key requirement for governments, uh, defense, and also certain industries, making sure that the supply chain is secure and keeps within their own country. Pat Gelsinger said there's too much reliance on Asia for semiconductors, and he wants to rebalance that as part of part of this project here. The second phase of IDM 2.0 is expansion, where Intel will use external fabs for its chips. Now, this has been talked about in the past about Intel using TSMC for some things. Um, Intel has made it clear that they're happy to work with TSMC, Samsung, Global Foundries, UMC, whatever they need to do to get the right chips they want for the right process, while Intel isn't the best in the manufacturing right now. Intel has a process to go and be the best, but until that time comes, they're ready to work with foundry partners and foundry competitors in order to build the best chips out there. Um, we already know that uh, products like Ponte Vecchio are going to be using uh, external foundry processes. Um, Intel has said that more chiplets and tiles coming down the line are going to be based on external foundry processes. And one of the issues here is trying to merge this. We have an advantage because we're vertically integrated, but we also need to use external fabs kind of yeah mixed messaging there um running your own fabs being vertically integrated meaning that you can supply at scale is one of the advantages of that but if you start using uh, external foundry processes then that scale might not always be there unless you pay over the odds for your processes so there's going to be some give and take there uh when working with tsmc tsmc has already said they're not interested in a small agreement with Intel. If Intel wants their chips, they're going to have to go in and go in big. I'm kind of thinking here that this is more of a five-year arrangement where Intel has a wafer supply agreement, perhaps with TSMC, for TSMC to supply Intel with wafers. Um, Intel has said, by contrast, that it will only work with external partners if it gets that unique value of co-optimization and co-design that regular customers don't need. There has to be a value add for Intel. Um, so Intel will only go in if they can go in with preferential treatment. TSMC will only go in if uh, they if Intel will go big uh, with TSMC. So I'm expecting at least a five year commitment between the two companies. Um, whether that will be crystallized out into a formal announcement, not sure, um, but we'll see. Third part of IDM 2.0 is productization of Intel Foundry. So Intel already has its Intel Foundry business that was kind of produced around 2013. Um, it was very select, only a few customers could build on it. Uh, you had to work with Intel with uh, designs in order to make it used on the process. Um, a lot of Intel's tools were very custom, just to Intel. They didn't necessarily use all the standard EDA tools in the industry, like Cadence and Synopsys. And it kind of died a death when 10 nanometer didn't roll out and customers like LG and Ericsson um, left because Intel wasn't able to meet their, their side of those contracts. 
Now what Intel is doing is creating its own Intel Foundry business, which is going to be a separate company headed up by Dr. Thacker, who has over 20 years of um, supply chain management in semiconductors and holds over 300 uh, patents in electronics engineering. Um, with Intel Foundry Process, they're going to be running it as a separate business to Intel, or a separate business unit, I should say. Um, so in the same way that Samsung, you have Samsung Semiconductor is a separate business, business unit to Samsung Foundry. Um, so that means that Samsung Semiconductor has to essentially order its wafers from Samsung Foundry uh, and compete with customers for Foundry access. So Intel isn't spinning out its labs, it's just forming its Foundry business under a separate business unit. Intel hasn't clarified whether the fabs themselves will be under that business unit. Uh, so there are questions there exactly as to, well, if Intel has customers on the Foundry side um, versus its own internal demands, who will get priority there? Pat Gelsinger has said that you know if they have customer agreements, then customer agreements will be honored. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But the idea here is that um, with Intel's hires over the last couple of years, especially external hires like uh, Murthy Renditon Chala, like uh, Jim Keller, like Raj Kaduri, and uh, Raj is the only one left out of those three. But I'm under the understanding that there was a big push uh, to make Intel's uh, design methodology more industry standard using more of those standardized EDA tools rather than doing all the custom stuff that Intel had created internally for only Intel to use. This means that uh, if customers wanted to use Intel, Intel's Foundry services, or so IFS, then they can go use those standardized tools and spit something out that will work on Intel's uh, Foundry um, manufacturing. Now, Intel has also expanded this to say that we will also be licensing our IP for customers. We're talking uh, interconnect, we're talking graphics, we're talking accelerators, we're talking AI, we're even talking x86 cores. Now, Intel hasn't specified exactly how this, um, how this licensing will go about. We already know licensing in the form of ARM's licensing. ARM either licenses cores or instructions set architecture, ISA. Um, with cores, with uh, ARM, if you license a core, you get the design kit for that core and you can put it into your own floor plan. Um, you can't, you're not allowed to change anything in that floor plan um, because that's part of the license agreement. And you just get the ports to stick in, you know, for power and PCIe. And it's a bit more complicated than that, but you get the idea. Uh, with Intel, what we suspect is going to happen is Intel will give you an encrypted, say, x86 core that you can run in your tools. And with Cadence and Synopsys, they'll have you know their own cryptographic package, so that can't be unlocked, but you'll be able to still use it in your designs. And then that will um, spit out a file that can then be sent to either Intel or TSMC or what have you. The other end of the IP spectrum would be a full ISA license, actually licensing out the x86 architecture. I don't think Intel's going to do that because Intel has historically been um, very controlling of its of the x86 designs. And in that, I'm including a 64-bit. It's just a blanket overall term. In the same way that Apple uses the ARM ISA and gets above and beyond what ARM can do, um, I don't think Intel would ever want to be in a position where somebody else can use the x86 ISA and go above and beyond Intel's x86 designs, uh, if you get what I'm saying. So I don't think that's really going to happen. Um, if it did, I I would say that Intel is perhaps in more dire straits than a lot of us think, but I don't think that's going to happen anyway. Um, but licensing out cores, it's going to be a new revenue stream for Intel. I don't necessarily think it's going to be a serious revenue stream, at least for another couple of years. I mean, the whole Foundry business might not be a serious revenue stream for at least two to three years. Um, and based on how customers were burned before, uh, we're reluctant to say how many customers will be involved. Uh, companies like uh, Sci5 on the Risk uh, v design side, they're already um, key partners along with uh, Qualcomm. Uh, they've already mentioned that they're going to be part of this program. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes forward. I have since learned that the product design kits for Intel's manufacturing nodes are pretty much ready to go. So customers can pick them up and start designing, ready for Intel, ready for when Intel wants to supply that. Uh, Pat Gelsinger said that he wants to be in a position where if a customer comes along and wants 5,000 wafers a month, you know, or about you know, 200,000 wafers a year, they can supply that. Now that's a large amount of wafers for a single customer, but that's the sort of position that Intel wants to be in. So aside from, IDM 2.0, there are kind of two, three other announcements uh, worth uh, mentioning. First off is a collaboration with IBM. Now, IBM is the leader in patents received per year in the US for like the last 20 years. And they do a lot of work on what's called pathfinding, finding the best way to move forward with manufacturing process technology. Uh, they already kind of do this with Samsung, but Intel has indicated that they want to do it with IBM as well. And 
To expedite our R&D innovation, I am proud to announce plans for a new research collaboration with IBM, which is focused on advanced silicon process and packaging technology. Both are foundational elements of manufacturing leadership, and Intel and IBM have been incredible sources of related innovation over the last 30 years. To tell you more about it, it is a true pleasure to welcome IBM CEO, Arvind Krishna. Arvind? Thank you, Pat, and congratulations once again for being named CEO and for the bold strategy you have put forward for Intel. So they haven't gone into details of this agreement, whether this will just be a like a cross-licensing agreement or whether Intel will design a very specific process node for IBM for its power and its Z-series processors, or whether there'll be like a combined research center with Intel and with IBM engineers. And it'll be interesting to see how Intel engineers react to IBM coming in and saying, well, we do a lot of things like this. If you go to any of the semiconductor conferences, there are always lots of IBM papers to read and they go into crazy amounts of detail. And anybody interested in learning about what exactly is going to go be coming down that route with this, um, with this collaboration, those papers are the best place to start. I'm sure we're going to hear more about this uh, later in the year. Another announcement as part of this design is that IDF is coming back, Intel Developer Forum. Hello, and I'm here at IDF. Um, going to be some interesting talks this week. Lots of meetings. It's kind of busy. And there's a crazy man showing down the street. Welcome to San Francisco. But it's not being called Intel Developer Forum. Um, IDF, uh, I, I think my first one was 2015, kind of late in the game. Uh, they started when Pat Gelsinger was at the company first time around. Uh, it is one of the best conferences to go to because it's just all Intel for like three days. Uh, I remember going and I'd have, um, you know, lecture, 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 lecture about all the new different designs. I remember learning about 3D cross points for the first time there. I was there during all the Skylake discussions and how to get the best out of Skylake architecture, how to get the best out of um, the Skylake's GPU at the time, uh, how to profile software, all the intricacies about um, uh, 14 nanometer at the time as well. It was just a great place to be, whether you were press, whether you were tech press, whether you were software based, they had partners there showing off equipment. This is also during their sort of like drone phase and um, Edison and Quark, that sort of like little IoT stuff phase. That was that was a really good, it was a really good show and it kind of dissolved because Intel felt it wasn't focused enough. And we all decried it and it's now got to a point where at Gelsinger or somebody at Intel has said, let's do this again. I'm not calling it IDF, unfortunately, I think that's that's a bad move. They're calling it Intel On series because they're going to be called Intel Innovation or Intel Vision. Innovation is going to be more sort of like the engineering software focus. Uh, vision is going to be more sort of like the financial uh, roadmap type stuff. But first event is going to be in October, November this year in San Francisco. And uh, if I can go, I'll be there. Another side of all of this is Intel's 7 nanometer uh, process technology. Uh, if you're thinking, Ian, why are you talking about 7 nanometer? Surely 10 nanometer still needs work. Um, yes, but we still got to think about the future. So Pat Gelsinger has said that the product for 2023 on 7 nanometer, Meteor Lake, is a client CPU. Now, it's not going to be Intel's first 7 nanometer chip. That's going to be Ponte Vecchio coming out end of this year, beginning of next for the Aurora supercomputer. But in terms of the client CPU space, Meteor Lake is going to be first. And what Intel is saying is they have done a tape in of their 2023 Meteor Lake 7 nanometer compute tile. In fact, we expect to tape in our 7 nanometer compute tile for Meteor Lake in the second quarter of this year. Meteor Lake features a breakthrough new x86 architecture and modular design, utilizing multiple manufacturing processes across our XPU IPs, as well as Intel's advanced Foveros packaging technology. Now, this raises a lot of questions, um, a lot of answers as well. So Meteor Lake is going to be using tiles, which means it's going to be kind of like a chiplet architecture. So we're going to have a compute die and an IO die. Intel's confirmed that the compute die is 7 nanometer. Intel 7 nanometer, not TSMC 7 nanometer. Um, one of the questions I've had is, what exactly is going to be on this compute tile? Uh, I fully expect cores all the way up to an L3 cache. Uh, unknown if there's going to be GPU on that. You could argue that GPU would be better served on a, either a separate tile or nearer to the memory, or even having its own memory tile connected to that. Um, 
all the I.O. is likely to be on an I.O. die, security processor on I.O. die, memory controller on the I.O. die, PCIe, CXL on the I.O. die. Um, where will the I.O. die be made? Could be an Intel 22 nanometer. Uh, not sure on that one, uh, but it could be an all Intel part. So overall, uh, this uh, Intel Unleashed event, I'm really glad it happened. Um, it has clarified a lot of things. Is also coming, coming out of the gate with guns firing about the next generation of Intel. Um, suffice to say that I'm more confident about Intel executing now than I was before the event. Um, since kind of Bob Swan left, it was kind of no man's land as to what was going to happen after after this year, aren't after you kind of you know Ponte Vecchio happened and talking about seven nanometer and five nanometer and such. So I'm really glad said very specific things there's obviously lots of questions still to go especially about foundry services especially about ip especially about tile strategy and how that's going to play out with intel tiles versus tsmc tiles and how they're going to be integrated together and what's going to come out for you me and everybody else and hpc but stage one pat gave a lot of interviews to the press uh, after the event still waiting on my interview <laughs> we'll see if that happens um lots of questions to ask and i hope he would be able to answer them I've been told a number of times that he likes to geek out on this stuff. Well, yeah, I do too. That's why I've got lots of questions. Uh, so what do you think about this event? Um, meaningful? Didn't really say anything about necessarily about gaming or such. So perhaps it didn't mean anything to you. Uh, or maybe you're an investor and this is the sort of thing you really need to know. So I really hope that over the year, Intel will shed some more light on all of this. Um, so I really have to ask after this event, what's the minimum specification here? Money for fabs? Good. Foundry services? Good. IP licensing, good. Tiles, good. Execution, please. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock.